Hey everybody and welcome back to ACIT. Today I wanted to do something different and use my own developing form as an example for how you can do form self-critiquing. And I realized from all the video footage that I've collected and shared uh, during my form development that I have uh, quite a bit of content I could use to illustrate some of the problems it seems like pretty much every developing player goes through. And so in this little montage, I've sprinkled like breadcrumbs throughout this series images of my developing form. And I've been doing a lot of work since the last video you saw. So uh, right off the cuff, um, big shout out to cbass 22 Sidewinder22 for his ongoing help in development. You'll see a lot of threads about how I talk about um, form and my development in the context of this. And I have a lot of good content linked below. Another shout out to Overthrow for some of the motivation getting me over the hump to do this particular montage. So here's our first throw. Uh, this is me back in the summertime and, um, you know, a lot right off the cuff that you can see that might make you, um, wince. And it's obviously a really muscled throw. This was me coming in as a beginner, trying to go out and do what I thought was field work and, uh, get discs out as far as I can. And pretty much not much more could be going wrong with this throw. Um, you can see me sort of pirouetting around the front leg here. Uh, it looks like I'm obviously putting a lot of effort in and uh, just not looking like a high quality, fundamentally sound throw. You can see the knee braces as evidence of uh, a lot of unnatural torque and tension I was putting on the knees. And so that's, uh, as you'll see, a sensitive topic for me throughout this series. I am very much safety oriented. When I share this content, for me, safety first was why I came to, to get some feedback of form review. Um, the distance and the consistency gains are just icing on the cake for me and what I continue to pursue now. I have a much safer swing uh, with uh, a lot more power and accuracy. So just breaking down a couple things here, you know, grip, terrible. Um, you, you see my wrist fully kind of flexing out here. And that's because my weight's moving forward against the disc moving back, which you, you do want in a throw, as we'll talk about. Um, but the wrist really isn't pouring the coffee. So I'm about to throw this at least somewhat nose up. My wrist is really floppy. And so we'll talk that you need a firm wrist heading into what we often term the power pocket because we want to apply uh, a bit of a tendon bounce and leverage onto that disc as we sling it out toward the target. So not really evident in this throw. So immediately, whatever power I'm getting from all this muscle, I'm losing by the time I reach uh, up to the version of the pocket here. I'm kind of crouched. My weight is leaning back over the rear foot. This is one of the most common things that you see when people are, are throwing out there. Um, their weight is way too far back. And what you want instead is your weight to be high and flowing ahead of this rear or dry foot and flowing into the plant step, which is somewhat perpendicular to the target. It varies a little bit by, by player and form, but let's call it 90 degrees for simplicity. And so I'm too low. I'm not getting that gravity boost. And if we watch closely here, you even see me rising right into the throw. And so I've got the opposite motion pattern in a lot of ways. Another thing you'll see is that I start with this disc in a wing down position which isn't necessarily bad. You'll see certain pros do this, but my forearm is rotating uh, sort of upwards into the podicate. So um, it's, it's supinating when instead we want to be pronating more. We want to have this sort of corkscrew in the other direction through. So I was getting a lot of strain in my shoulder and elbow early on because of that corkscrewing pattern. All right, so just a couple other things to point out. This is something you're going to see in a lot of um, form, something like this. So shoulders slanted upwards, right? Uh, we've got my eyes like looking for the target, right? They're, they're not with the disc. It looks very natural. I'm putting some strain here on the neck. Um, and I'm um, kind of come over top and are around the brace. Um, so again, like there's kind of weird stress coming in through the knees. Um, I'm not really getting into um, a strong pocket at any point in the swing. The disc is coming around. So one thing I, I was getting was sort of, you know, uh, some approximation of a hit point out in front of my body to, to get some whip on the disc, but nothing leading up to that is, is optimal. And some of it is, is in fact dangerous. So, um, shortly after this, I started doing some self form critiquing and I'm trying to just get this stuff cleaned up. And, um, this next throw is where I landed. So in this one, 
you can see that I've graduated to compression sleeves here. Um, you know, knee's not doing great. Uh, I ended up in some physical therapy to do exercises to, to get them recovered. Um, but when I was feeling better, uh, I'm trying to clean up form, right? And, um, you know, for me, I, I don't have a great body awareness for throwing sports. And if you watch this throw, it's definitely different than the first one, uh, but everything is way too linear. Um, I, you've got my, my shoulders parallel to the ground the whole time. I'm kind of striding in this sort of robot-like fashion toward the target. Um, I've got a little bit of off-arm action going on here. Um, I have less of this pronounced shoulder slant, but I'm still not shifting my weight correctly uh, to bring that sort of shoulder down and through, as we'll see, to maximally power the throw. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of still not quite getting into a strong pocket position. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm keeping a little bit better my head with my posture, uh, but, you know, weight transfer, you can see me dragging some weight in this rear foot. This rear foot is too turned out. This rear foot being turned out is again, another really big symptom and thing that you'll see out there that you're, you're not about to get good leverage from the ground. You're not going to get good hip action. You're not going to get a good weight transfer. And if you lack all of that, I don't care how good your upper body mechanics are you ain't going to get much uh, distance advantage out of this because the, the ground and your legs are the big powerhouse of the throw combined with your, your posture and your balance. Okay. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm feeling a little better here. I'm not hurting myself as much. This is what got me to get some advice. Um, and so, uh, this is the beginning of that journey there. So when we move on to the next throw and one of them featured, uh, earlier in the series, um, a few things are about to start to look very different. And you're going to notice immediately that this throw looks a lot more dynamic. There's more curvature in my body. Uh, there's a lot more up down action with respect to gravity. So let's check it out. So here at the end of this throw, you can see that I've got counterbalancing happening with this leg. It's kind of tucking in and behind the other leg. A lot of people talk about this idea of the knee drop. And, um, I want you to think of that as a symptom, not a, a cause or a goal. So my knee is dropping because my weight is starting to transfer better into that plant. But you can see from this posture that I've still got a little bit too much strain. I'm kind of bunching up through the neck, shoulders coming up again, whereas it should be swinging back and forth uh, away from and toward the target. And earlier in the swing, right here, you can see that this disc is at a very extreme sloped angle. And so one of the things to think about with form is you're going to have a lot of things to adjust and not all of them are going to sink in right away for you. Uh, and again, for me, not a lot of body control going into this for throwing. So I basically had to work on every single joint in some form to improve my form. And so this wrist was a huge limiter for me where it didn't matter how much more power I'm getting from my body. If I didn't have this disc in that, you know, firm, um, but, but not overcooked, uh, pour the coffee position, ain't going to matter. I'm not getting a lot more distance. So this, these were coming out much easier just because you can see how much of my, my weight is leading this throw already. Uh, this is going to come out nose up and it's going to come out kind of floppy. No good. Um, back foot still pointed away from the target too much. My advice on that is take that rear foot, move it in to be as perpendicular to the target, just like your plant step as you can. What most people will find uh, is that their hips are kind of slightly externally rotated. And so what that means is their feet are naturally going to point out a little bit. Get my hands back here, sorry. They're going to point out a little bit. And so a neutral position will still look like that toe is pointing a bit away from the target on that rear foot. But in your hip, you're going to feel much more firmly connected back against uh, that joint in the ground. And so that's part of what's helping propel all of that uh, force toward the target and helping you very quickly transfer from foot to foot. So here you can see I'm still pretty flat footed, footed and that's because this foot is, is not turned in enough. Um, I'm, I'm landing in the plant more firmly and I'm not getting good transfer. You're starting to see me get some off arm action here. We'll return to that. I've had to make a lot of little adjustments to that, uh, making new adjustments again, but it's in there. So I'm starting to get, as you'll see in the throw, just watch it a couple times through. I'm coming up, down, staying low through the throw. So I've compressed into the earth. 
and I'm pushing back against the earth to power that throw. Up, down, compress, power through. Up, down, power through. So we're, we're, we're kind of getting on the right track. We've turned it from a very sort of staccato robotic motion. It's starting to look a little more organic. Uh, there's definitely more potential power coming through the chain. Um, the sequencing is starting to look better, but there's lots of little posture things. So let me just focus one more time here. You can already see this happening out of uh, the backswing. So as, as I'm starting to shift the weight forward, right? And I've, I've got a shift, my weight's up here. It's just a little, little slow and laggy. Um, off arm, not quite tucked as we, what we mentioned. Um, so the problem is I haven't still fully gotten into what we call a shift from behind. And I'm not really taking my shoulder to lead the swing toward the target. It's, it's tending always to open up. Not sure exactly where I acquired that habit. A lot of people have some version of this though. So you need a combination of a good shift heading into the plant. And you need to really, for a lot of people, think about like, I'm swinging my arm with my shoulder. I'm swinging my arm with my shoulder. Your arm isn't doing the throwing. Your arm is the whip along for the ride. Swing with your shoulder. Swing with your shoulder. Okay. So feeling good about this. Um, I can see it looks a lot different. Take it onto the course. And um, we see a lot more of the same here. I've been making a lot of little adjustments. I've been working on my feet a bit. So as we watch this throw, you'll notice a few things off the cuff. So first I'm taking everything pretty lateral toward the target. Um, I, I really do think that um, it's good advice when you're learning to try to square the whole approach up to something like 90 degrees, because even if you, you see pros starting facing the target, you'll notice they'll start rotating their body into something like a 90 degrees approach. They might be 20 degrees or so off the angle. These are things we can talk about later. Um, but you got to get everything kind of packed and squared up. You want to get everything at 90 degrees and move into the target. And so when you watch me take the step before the plant here, I started to get those toes back in a little bit. And this was around the first time I was feeling like that drive leg was actually doing something for me. And so one of the key ideas here um, that we don't often talk about is whether you're walking past the disc or using a pendulum, you want that backswing to feel like it's in contact with that rear foot. Sometimes you talk about bracing in the plant leg. There's a brace in the rear foot as well. You want your backswing, the reach back to feel braced firmly with that rear hip and leg. It shouldn't feel uncomfortable. It should just kind of feel nice and tight and athletic and compact as that hip loads back. And then you spring out of it into the, the plant. That plant's forming a second brace that is bracing the swing. And so as soon as the plant here lands, again, weight transfer is still not great. My, my posture is a little too staggered. I'm not quite lined up the right way. My swim move is about to, to come through, helping to lead the swing. Not as tight as it should be. Okay. Uh, shoulders may be coming down a little bit, but still going up, right? So I'm kind of coming up uh, too early. Um, and the problem here again is I'm getting that disc actually a fair way up the fair, up the fair way up the fairway. The disc is going up the fairway um, pretty far at this point, just because of my mass and weight being into the throw, but I'm leaking power. So remember, it's conservation of power. You want, you want everything you're getting from the ground and the momentum you're bringing into the swing to get into the disc. And so here's the second sign of that. So uh, you can see I'm a little off balance here. My, my posture is kind of tipping forward. Um, you know, I, I've swum through my, my counterbalancing leg is following, but let's watch again what happens after this throw. So my body's swinging wide out away. So I, I had been braced. I threw behind a brace, but because of my posture and the way I was uh, heading into the plant, I've now got very awkward, inefficient follow through. Uh, in other words, I haven't gotten as much into the disc as I could have. And it, my body is carrying that around. So I end up in balance, but I end up driven past this. Now you might say, hey, some pros end up carrying through like that. You know, what's wrong with it? Well, it depends what you mean. And so um, you'll often see a lot of pros kind of wrapping around after they brace and throw when um, they're doing a max distance drive, right? And so at a certain point, you're getting diminishing returns no matter how much power you put in, no matter how good your form is. There's some theoretical limit about how much you can get into the disc. So even if the form is pretty efficient, at a certain point, you're adding more and more juice that 
counter rotation is going to keep following through. Uh, the other point to make is that even very high level throwers could be making adjustments to have that sequence be more efficient. And so um, I use the follow through as does my mentor and other people I've learned from as a signature, right? Of like, how good was this throw? And we'll, we'll see this at the end. All right. But well, so we're, we're making little adjustments. We're making some progress, things to work on. Okay. So here is when I started in the lag module talking about the disc lagging behind. And um, this was interesting because uh, now I kind of have a few more things on the table to work with and they're not integrating well yet. And so I've got that um, drive foot in a slightly better position. I'm feeling leverage. My weight and butt are leading that better. Still a little too tilted over and I'm going to stride slightly too far out here. And so um, when you're striding like this, the weight shift needs to come in such that your weight feels as though it's literally falling pretty much directly behind you, even though this foot is planted around 90 degrees to target. And I cannot tell you how strange this sensation was the first time I learned it and how hard it was for me to do it consistently. And I don't think many people uh, talk much about this or enough or do it well. Um, and so we'll, we'll see a bit later what that looks like when it's better, because it's a sort of subtle thing if you, you aren't really used to looking at your own form or others. Um, I'll even mention, um, you know, Simon Lazat has a, a video where he talks about this stride wide out toward the target. If you go check out a link to Seabass 22s video, you'll, you'll see that the curve that the foot takes to get there, it sort of swings inside and then back out again. That's really important because what it's doing is heading, setting up your hips so that they can swivel as you're striding, right? You don't want your hips to kind of jam into a wide step. You want them to be closing and opening back out in a figure eight pattern, okay? And so we don't see that here. And because we don't have that shift, let's watch what happens when I go into the swing. Shoulders coming up again. And so I haven't quite settled that weight fully from behind, opening up. So everything is much more compact here. And so this is where my body was sort of kind of tightening things up a little bit shift is still not completely in the right spot and that's creating big problems there's a lot of power missing from this throw and so something that was kind of like bottlenecking me at you know throws that were you know decent for me but in the high 300s at first um versus clearing over 400 is getting this this weight shift to really work and, and function well and consistently so uh, again got off armor coming in you're starting to see the weight shift um get quicker it's just not ideal. It's not shifting from behind. Getting better balance, getting better follow through already. All right, rear views tell you a lot. Um, so I often triage things in this 90 degree to T as uh, have my mentors because you can see a lot of the mechanics moving along, but there are a couple of things to point out from the rear view here. Uh, I wanna talk a bit about rounding because I think that um, there's some misunderstandings about what that implies. Uh, some people see the disc come wide out from the body, right? We talked about that as a sort of wide rail technique. Um, but there's also this idea of a relatively straight disc in place reach back. You see me using often this pendulum style. So let's just point out a couple of things. So I'm kind of striding up to the target. I'm trying to get it in the net. And as I'm trying to get it in the net, you can see that um, already my plant foot is something at 90 degrees to that approach. And I'm approaching again laterally. So when I practice... Uh, take that lateral approach uh, toward the target, try to get your feet nice and packed up and squared up. You'll find that leverage from the, the rear foot. My posture is starting to get, again, a little better. I've got some curvature here. I'm now braced. I'm ready to pump with the front leg a bit, which we'll return to. Uh, swim moves coming in a little bit tighter. Still some adjustments to make. Well, where should this disc be? Um, it could be a little bit maybe farther out. Um, rounding would be kind of fully crossing over the body and reaching the round. So there's this very fine line, not often talked about, about what is rounding and what's an ideal swing path. Um, not quite ideal in this posture, um, but the thing is, when you notice in a high level form and you can see this in top down views, um, depending on how far they wanna throw, they might change the exact position of that disc behind them. And so uh, there's an inside swing drill that I would use and still use often from Seabass 22 to find sort of the correct tilt and posture and alignment for that backswing relative to the body. And what you'll see in that case is that there's a moment where the disc is loading behind the shoulder 
So if it were me, this could, could probably be a little bit farther out in the ideal position. That's usually where it ends up. However, because you're then coming in with the body and that tilt, the disc is actually going to transiently very quickly come back toward your body and then come back out. The swing plane is not straight and flat, right? It might look that way in certain camera orientations, but if you get a 3D view of any high level swing, it's got this curve in, curve out sort of profile. Wide rail, it's more exaggerated. It starts wide out, comes in, goes out. Okay. So that's typically what you'll see. There are a couple of exceptions. Um, Seppo Paiu will, will kind of have some of it coiled in in his shorter range shots, but um, at max extension, you'll see a pattern like that. So um, we're, we're starting to get there. Shoulders still coming up too early. Weight shift still not great. All right. It's kind of functional, um, but we have more work to do. All right. Here's where things got exciting. And then I felt like I was starting over. So um, I've been doing a lot of work to this point. Um, I was going out doing some field work. Uh, it's nice to get out of the basement and get some fresh air. And um, I was just launching some comments in the field. And I had a couple of landmarks, right? I can use to kind of distance measure them um, and verify those in a couple of ways. So I kind of use this as like, how well are my throws doing, right? That's what I do at this field. And so um, I throw comments a lot. It's probably my favorite disc overall at this point, because in field work, um, it's really healthy if you want to develop form to work with these very neutral to understable discs. If you can throw them on a little hyzer flip and control them well, throwing flat to fade or um, just fading straight ahead toward the target, um, uh, huge benefit to your game. Um, because then everything varies with respect to that, right? If you can throw the disc on a little hyzer flip to straight, well, then you just need to know you need to tweak the angle a little bit one way or another to get different effects. You know, if you throw a different disc the same way where that's going to go. So by constantly going back to comets and similar discs, um, I really attribute that to the, the biggest gains in accuracy and touch. And then when you go up to power shots, um, you know, you, you can rely on more stability of the disc and, and otherwise if you need to. All right. Anyway, so um, orienting for the target in the pump. Foot still a little bit turned out. Reach back's a little bit too low. Swim is back on through and I'm carrying a lot into the follow through again. So I'm kind of wrapping around the brace, but you might notice that in this particular throw, and here's a, a good snapshot to focus in on, um, a couple of good things are starting to happen here. So the arm has now uh, moved through a pocket position. Um, we've got the shoulder leading the elbow, reading the wrist nicely. I've got the disc down and like I'm throwing a hammer out, right? With decent leverage. Uh, my eyes are now oriented more toward the target, but they've tracked the disc position pretty well. So I've kind of got a natural position of my head over the spine. Um, and uh, you can see my, my shoulders here um, looking like they're just in a, a much more powerful position, right? So I've, 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 I'm the same way you would swing a sledgehammer or heavy weight. That's the posture my upper body is in. Um, and so these were uh, really exciting to me because this is the first time I was starting to see really nice mid-range distance. Um, a few of these at the end of the session would be able to go 330, 340 down range, uh, pretty good control on a, a hyzer flip to flat to slight turnover shot. And so I'm uh, saying, okay, awesome. This is really exciting to me. Uh, hard work is paying off. However, if we go back and we watch these feet, so we're about to plant with the feet here. Watch my knees very closely. This is a subtle thing, but important. I've kind of shrunk into that knee and watch my toe in the drive leg. It dry, drags off the ground. So something that I was doing exactly backwards with my legs all the way up to this point, and in each preceding one, you can see this if you look for it, I'm kind of sinking. And then my front leg is also kind of sinking. So when your legs are working in this uh, disc golf throw, like a lot of sports, they should feel more like pogo springs, as we mentioned in the series. It should, should be getting a load on it and unloading very quickly. And that's part of how the tra weight transfer works from the drive uh, to the plant step, right? So we kind of like get a little load on the drive, our weight's in front of it. It's kind of pogoing to accelerate it a bit, land into this leg. And then this is what some sports call posting up. That plant leg here should extend and I'm kind of getting it, kind of getting it, but there's been way too much compression. So at this point, my knees are trying to protect themselves, right? 
Uh, the knees, uh, for me, because I have this injury history, um, these are really stubborn habits. When a joint has had pain, historically, those are often the really hard movements to change because our bodies like to compensate to pain, right? And so um, even though this upper body's starting to get in a, a much better position, I really felt like I was starting all over again because I had to relearn the legs. So let's talk about how that should look. This is uh, another drill, excellent drill, hammer swing X step linked uh, below. Um, I still do this drill. Uh, I do it with heavy hammers. I do it with kettlebells now. And this drill is really useful in a lot of ways because when you force your body to swing something heavy, it's very hard for it to stay in balance without the correct posture and rhythm. So I recommend starting something lighter, you know, just a two or three pounds to start to get the tempo. If you try that drill, um, the reason I graduated to kettlebells is, um, just like any exercise, I'm kind of conditioning and training the body to an extent, but more importantly, I'm really feeling like my body is weighted uh, and anchored to the ground to, to control the heavier weight. And I do it nice and easy. I'm not going wild way up and down with a heavier weight, uh, but really, really effective to, to my development. You're going to just feel so much better in touch with the ground when you do that. Um, so I'm doing this drill and um, uh, Seabass is recommended doing it backwards. So just like my leg action had been backwards in the swing, he had the brilliant idea to, well, why don't you just start the movement backwards to gain control in that direction and then bring it forwards. So you can see that my, my hips are starting to rock back and forth much more naturally. Feet need a little bit of work here, um, but I've got my shoulder swinging back behind the rear hip, right? That's a powerful posture to leave the swing. We're mirroring that back forward and then we bring it into the swing. So a couple things still not working out here. So we're about to hit this stride. I'm reaching too far down. This is a habit I found very hard to kick. And I think it's um, one of the trickier things if you're trying a pendulum system, you want that backswing to be uh, a compromise between like totally vertical and totally, totally horizontal. So everybody has a slightly different arm slot. I'm still working on mine to an extent. And so here I'm swinging a little too far down, but the cool thing about pendulums, and it was really subtle here, is when I swing back, watch the disc come up away from the target and then how quickly it comes forward back toward the target. So let's see it right here. Watch, keep your eyes on this disc, see where it swings up to and then watch it go forward. So just like you get the advice from the reach past the disc um, way of teaching, this is a very effective way to learn how to get your weight to oppose the disc and uh, bring it back toward the target. And so this is yet another reason I really think whether or not you stick with a pendulum, it's a very effective tool to learn. I've learned much more quickly uh, doing this for certain pieces of form. Um, so here I'm coming into a tighter pocket, like we saw before. This knee is too, too squishy. I don't have good control. So you can see my knee flex and leak out toward the target getting over that, but you can already tell I'm a little bit too bunched behind it. You know, I've counterbalanced back with this rear leg the way I should, um, but I'm just a little bit out of control. My plant stride's not great. Uh, lots to tweak. Okay. So um, here's another version of the X step with uh, the reach back and stride. So at this moment, watch the disc. And it went back behind where my, my pointer was, right? So let's do it again. There's a point where uh, I'm about to stride past it. See, it's right here. This is poking back. So one of the things that I found tricky as I've been learning the weight shift is um, what does it mean to, to walk past the disc? Um, is it an active backswing? Is it an active reset, uh, reach back? I don't like the active passive terminology so much because I think it gets people focused on like controlling minutia about certain muscle groups and other things. Um, what I want to focus on is tension. You should feel as though your weight moving forward has tension as your back is opening out. You can achieve that by back swinging with a pendulum. You can also achieve that by trying to keep the disc stationary, moving past the disc and letting the weight oppose it. So I'd spent so much more time with the, the pendulum style. I find it still a little easier to, to find that sweet spot. Um, but, I, but I also, as you'll see, practice walk past the disc um, at this point too. I think that you can learn from both styles. I just happened to, to spend a lot of time with pendulums. So we're gonna go back to standstills and um, 
a lot of people wonder how long should I spend with a uh, standstill before I get to a next step, or is it really worth it to spend the time doing that or, you know, concerns like this. Um, and I, I would say, um, it depends on your goals. If you're really serious about your form work and you want to get good mastery of mechanics and you want to really push the limits in your ceiling, um, for most players, it's just simpler to isolate the movements and, and work them out and massage them when you don't also have to worry about the strides going in. An X step is a walk or run into a standstill. It's exactly the same mechanisms, right? It's easy not to see that if you're not used to looking for it, but the same mechanics you'll see I'm working on in the standstills are what happens in the X step. And my X step gets better the more I work on my standstills even when I'm not working on my X step. And so um, I say mix it up a little bit. Uh, at this moment, still, I'm back to at least 90-10 standstills to X step. I, I'm really trying to pin down, okay, like there's lots of little fussy adjustments and the more control, 100% uh, of the time, the more control I get over the standstill, the better my X step gets. And part of that's a signal to noise thing. If your standstill feels really controlled and crisp and you're throwing far and your X step feels kind of crummy and weak and, and slower out of balance, um, your, your body's going to try to adapt to that. It's going to make it easier to transfer some of those movements. Um, but you know, it, for me, not coming into this with a throwing background, especially really fussy work. I spend a little time every day making little adjustments, trying to retrain balance. Okay. So expectations are important going into it. So, um, a few things are, are looking okay with this standstill. Um, I've got a very powerful looking posture uh, and part of it, I've got a little bit of tilt in the shoulders. I've got a strong backswing. This is around my ideal arm slot through this backswing. Um, you saw my weight sink. So it's sinking back and toward the target. And if we watch the swing in its entirety, I've used that weight to anchor to the ground and pull through, right? So you can really see me staying low and powering through to the target. But a couple of things might look funky to you. So I'm entering here, uh, still got a little bit of the shoulder bunching. Um, you know, my, my off arm is lingering a little bit behind now, right? And so this is just a principle of, of patience and practice. I'd been making lots of adjustments over the last uh, few weeks leading up to this. Not everything is staying nice and tight when I'm focused on the new thing, namely the weight shift here. And so this is the shift from behind I'm talking about. My weight is up. Look, my butt is sort of oriented at an angle back toward the target. My foot is coming in into 90 degrees, but you can see kind of imagine a line from this hand back to the butt. My, my weight is coming almost directly back at the target into that heel. So it's kind of moving from toe to heel as I, I sink back into it. And again, check out the drink, uh, the, the links below um, for drills for this. It feels incredibly strange because you have to submit like a trust fall to this shift from behind. And I recommend practicing it over just an inch or two, right? Because if you do it over a larger range, your body's going to try and catch you. Lots of people have these like hips turned slightly or, or openly uh, completely toward the target before they even plant because your brain is terrified of falling backwards. It doesn't want to do it. So you have to kind of convince it that it's okay, that you're still in control, even though you're falling behind into the plant. And the reason you want to fall behind into the plant is because you can imagine the center of gravity moving forward against this disc, and it's going to whip it through, right? Um, if that is off away from the target in some way, you're just losing potential power. Right? You're not getting your full weight opposing that and then um, rotating through and around. Okay, The weight shift is also setting up a better shoulder path. So my shoulder is getting lower in part just because now my, my hip is allowed to clear back. This front hip here, I mean. So the plant step, right, I've shifted my weight down into it. And as I'm swinging over top of that leg, I'm hinging on that hip, right? And it's clearing back and away from the target, opening the arm out right? To swing the disc. Um, so now that the shoulder has a little more clearance to get around and I can swing back and forth through the target more easily, much more powerful, but there's a problem with this swing in addition to the off arm. So if I'm here, watch what happens with this plant knee. Staying very crouched and you can see my posture kind of like hunching forward and, and over it in this low crouched position. 
Um, so my, my brain has kicked in again and said, look, I'm, I don't want any pain here. Please, please protect it. Uh, I'm not going to let you post it back up. I'm not going to let you get that full leverage from the ground. So I'm losing a lot of energy because I'm kind of leaking it into staying compressed and not posting back up. And again, this is one of those things you'll, you'll have it in your own forum, lots of drilling, right? Lots of checking in um, on the video, throwing from one leg in a one leg drill, trying to get used to pumping off that plant leg, convincing it it's safe. And the reason it's safe is because if you compress and then decompress quickly and correctly, it's taking the weight off of that uh, foot almost completely in many cases, right? You, it's, you're going to feel light on that foot momentarily because you've transferred the force up the chain and into the disc. And as your, your shoulder and arm are swinging around, that's pulling you into the follow through, right? So that's why this knee is safe if you are throwing correctly with that pogo-like action. So here, it's actually worse for my knee to do this compression and swing because there's, there's more effective weight still on that knee. Um, and so I, I needed to work this out. Okay. So the knee in this case, you can see my posture is adjusted a little bit. Again, I'm stacked a bit more upright. My backswing is coming up into a powerful position and then watch this plant knee and look at this follow through. So I'm much more upright. My arm has ended up coiled around me. Uh, this rear arm trailing behind, um, this plant foot is getting closer to kind of aiming right where I was trying to throw. You'll often see that in high level form, um, where it's sort of pointed more or less directly at the target. Uh, I've counterbalanced and sort of coiled and uncoiled in a very natural way to end up in this position. And the other thing that's happening is if you watch this spine curvature, I tilt into the backswing slightly and I tilt as I move forward. So this is creating separation between my head and my shoulder, allowing that spine to curve. And you can think about that as another whip in the spine. So if I've, if I've got my spine here and I'm tilting it one way in the backswing, I'm gonna get a faster whip through. It's gonna precess, is a word for that, around as I rotate into that swing, okay? The rotation in the swing, again, is merely happening because I'm shifting better into this stride and I'm in better posture coming through. And you can see here that my shoulder is going to swing up, but not like it was before. It is swinging back and forth over my knees and it has clearance through the weight shift to open out toward the target. And that curvature at the end is adding, uh, again, uh, I haven't tested it yet, but um, these discs are coming out faster again because I finally now have a good base of weight shift in this uh, lower body. Okay. So another swing here, I want to illustrate something subtle. When I backswing on this one, I'm sinking too early. I'm staying low, but I sink too early. Whereas this previous throw, I stay high and then I shift down and away from the disc nice separation, shoulder swinging wide, nice and braced up, balanced in the follow through, right? And so um, for my standstills, this is more or less the stage where I am right now. There's a lot to make consistent and clean up here. I can get my, my feet in a slightly better position in each swing. I can work on that back swing. Uh, I'm trying to find sort of the ideal tilt. So pretty fussy work, right? I mean, I'm trying to get mastery and control over that. And just like Swinging a bat in baseball, hitting a ball in tennis, right? Lots of reps. Uh, check the video, right? Um, get somebody else to check it out and uh, improve it successively. Um, but but much better. These swings um, come out very quick, and they they really don't feel difficult at all. Um, they're uh, among the, the fastest throws that I've had. So this finish in address position, as it's sometimes called, is a good signature for the quality of your form coming in. You, you can't cheat this position because uh, once you're sort of braced and you've set things in motion for the swing, whatever happens after that happens after that. And what gets into the disc gets into the disc and the rest is in your body. And so the better posture you are in the end and this nice um, coiled up wrapped around pattern 
uh, is a uh, kind of honest indicator, right? How quality was this throw? So not perfect here, but this was giving me some confidence that, hey, it was around time to put up a video like this and say, are we on the right track? And again, with uh, quite a bit of help, um, looking a lot better. And we're into the, the, the fussy, meticulous stage on this. So let's return to the first throw that we reviewed today and compare it to my current X step form. So night and day, we're seeing a fair amount of transfer from those standstill mechanics into my X step. Still quite a bit to, to button up. So to be self-critical looking forward here, uh, a lot of little things, uh, I'm still keeping my weight trapped a little bit too far back on some swings. Uh, this back swing is, is coming maybe a little bit low. Uh, however, as I'm transitioning into the pocket, I've got good dynamism and curvature. Once the weight transfer commits, um, I'm posting up pretty well through that front leg. So kind of a blur out of that. And so once posted on this leg, I'm carrying my balance uh, forward and upright uh, pretty well into this coiled finish and address position. So um, at this stage, uh, a lot of tweaking to do. So adjusting every little piece of this, uh, try to tighten up the form, get the weight shift into a better position, uh, slowly improve the posture. Uh, but I'm, I'm certainly feeling much less stress on the body. And on good swings, I'm getting a, a lot more power and consistency on the course. So um, if you're out there working on these projects on your own, um, you know, have those expectations, set some goals, try to isolate a piece or two at a time and work at them persistently and seek feedback from a, a more expert eye if it's available to you because uh, it can really take you a long way. The transition between this form and this was, uh, I would say about six months of focused field work. So it, it really was hard work, but it was a lot of hard work distributed over a period of time. And like a lot of things, I expect that the next six months will be um, easier in some ways because the foundations are much better and harder to make a lot of these little micro adjustments, um, you know, nudging the weight in the right places, moving things by an inch or two, and then just reinforcing, reinforcing, reinforcing. Um, of course, getting out there and playing, right? I'm not sitting around waiting for my form to be perfect. I don't know what perfect form really means. I think that um, even pros will, will talk about often making little tweaks here and there on the fly uh, as things uh, sort of drift out of whack or they can find little improvements. So have fun, be safe, and good luck in your form journey, and look out for more content soon. Thanks very much.